<laughs> well, we're back now to talk about the politics of this week's uh, budget deal with two people who saw it up close, <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly. Major Garrett of National Journal and our own Nancy Cordes, who, uh, both of whom cover Capitol Hill. Uh, Major, uh, what do you make of this? What does this pretend for what's about to happen here, this, this uh, situation with raising the debt ceiling? A couple of things, that the system can work and that Senator Reid and Speaker Boehner have a better relationship than they had before, as does Speaker Boehner and the President of the United States. That all counts because before they really were testing each other to find out who could prevail. And both sides to a certain degree prevailed, but it's quite clear, Bob, that from where this deba debate started to where it ended up, Speaker Boehner drove this farther than the President or Harry Reid did. Remember, at the beginning, Senate Democrats in the White House wanted no cuts from the 2010 budget. They've now agreed to almost $39 billion. Senator Schumer was just talking about taxing oil and gas companies. That was also part of the initial Senate Democratic bid. That issue was completely pushed aside. He's now re resurrecting it. But Republicans know if that debate or that argument didn't work the first time, it's unlikely to work the second time. Internally, House Republicans feel though well, they didn't get all that they wanted, they got more than they expected. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not into this who won and who lost business. I don't think anybody won, quite frankly, and I'll have a little more to say about that later. But I, I would have to say this. I think probably Speaker Boehner had the hardest job here, didn't he? Because it wasn't just the Republicans against the Democrats. It was Boehner kind of in between because he had all these Tea Party people on his right. He did, but it also gave him great leverage because he was able to go to the White House and say, look, you're going to need to give because I've got these Tea Party folks and they are not going to be happy unless you meet me halfway. I think he said at one point, you know, thank you, Tea Party members, for putting me in this box. Uh, he w ended up going in there asking for a lot and got more than halfway to where he wanted to go. And I wrote on Friday afternoon, Bob, after the first Republican conference meeting, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, many of the freshmen... Uh, said, Mr. Speaker, go cut us a deal. We have, you have our back, we have your back. Whatever you come back and tell us is the deal, we will accept. And Austin Scott, who's the president of the 87-member freshman class, said, sight unseen, whatever you bring back, I trust, I personally will support. That was a key moment for Speaker Boehner because he was then able to say, all right, I have a deal and it can hold. Do you, do you think, Nancy, uh, there's some talk that they will take this Ryan plan, the Paul Ryan plan, which calls for cutting, what, six trillion dollars out of the budget over the next 10 years and really does overhaul Medicare and Medicaid. There's some very serious changes in this. Uh, some on the Republican side are talking about just attaching that to the uh, debt uh, limit uh, bill and, and, and having a vote on that. Do you think that's what's going to happen? Well, here? I think you can see that the White House is worried about that because they were hoping to put off this fight over Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security until after the presidential election. Now you hear David Pluff saying the president's going to come out and talk about it this week. They know Republicans are going to engage on this issue no matter what, and they've got to be prepared to fight against it. Do you think, in fact, uh, Major, that some Democrats may be praying they attach that to the, uh, to the vote because then they can and say, look what these mean old Republicans are doing? Certainly, and I think House Republicans know that that's probably a bridge too far this soon on the debt ceiling vote. But they want things that change the way Washington builds its budgets. So there might be other process reforms, going to a two-year budget cycle, doing other things that put a higher premium on balancing the budget or reducing spending as opposed to increasing budget baselines. I know that's a bit wonky, but I think that's where House Republicans are heading. The other thing is, Last week, Charles Schumer said John Boehner was the reasonable Republican to deal with. John Boehner has one of the most conservative voting records in the history of Congress. So for Democrats to say and now portray Speaker Boehner as the voice of reasonableness against the Tea Party, when the divisions with John Boehner and the Tea Party were minuscule in the end anyway, I think puts Republicans, at least for now, in a stronger position than they were, and the assumptions that they would be divided and unable to govern are less true than they were maybe two months ago. And I think they've come up with a couple of negotiating tactics that really work for them when, as they like to say, they only control one third of the government. First of all, they ask for the whole enchilada. You know, they have these 40 or 50 riders on all these sensitive social issues, and they were able to just hand those in one by one on Planned Parenthood and on the EPA and get another billion in cuts, another billion in cuts each time. So, uh, so that really worked for them. And they also showed they were willing to go right up to the brink on a government shutdown to get their way, and that's something they may repeat when it comes to uh, funding the government with the debt ceiling. One other quick point going forward, Bob. I think the president's announcement through David Plough today that he will put together this speech on entitlement reform and other budgetary issues 
begs a very important question. With that speech, will the president essentially be discounting the budget he submitted to Congress? Because on, in this fight, the president's already given ground. He originally said, freeze 2011 spending, but cut nothing from the 2010 enacted budget. He's now cutting that by almost $39 billion. If he talks about significant entitlement reform that was none in his budget, does that budget he submitted to Congress become, by his own word and action, essentially a dead letter? One of the things in the uh, Paul Ryan plan is this plan to basically overhaul Medicare and go back to make it uh, into private insurance that seniors would have options to buy and then there would be federal subsidies. That's Something totally called different. premium support, yes. Yeah. Uh, it also calls on Medicaid, which is the uh, aid for poor people. It just simply does away with it, sends that money and block grants yes. to the states and lets the state and lets the states administer it as, as they choose. Do either of you think that either of those proposals uh, can fly in the United States Senate? Well, I think Medicaid has a chance, although there are some conservatives who don't believe block granting is a good idea. And there are many governors, Republican and Democrat, who don't want the responsibility of handling that block granted money for Medicaid. They would like the money, but they also know there will become great responsibility to deliver those services and all of the political risks would come with their administering of Medicaid. So that's something that is an idea that works great theoretically. But as far as practical politics, I'm not sure it works out. Moving Medicare from what fee-for-service to premium support is an enormous tidal shift in the way the government deals with elderly health care. That's an awfully ambitious thing. Paul Ryan is trying to move it in that direction. If he gets halfway that far, he'd probably accept that. It's dead on arrival in the Senate in that form because what Democrats say is that the greatest leverage that Medicare has to bring down prices overall is that it's so big and covers so many people. If you take that money and send it all to the private sector, you basically give up any leverage the government has to bring down prices. All right. Well, thanks to both of you. But one thing's for sure, you're both going to have plenty to do. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt.